Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Cross, and I am a retired, or what they sometimes call an emeritus professor from Oklahoma State University, uh, where I was in the civil engineering department and was basically the asphalt professor. And for the last eight to ten years, I've also been serving as the technical director of the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association. And we are a trade association that's made up of contractors, uh, suppliers, and consultants or engineers that are uh, working the in-place recycling field. So what we want to talk about today, I want to give you a brief overview of uh, cold central plant recycling. This is one of the hot topics uh, these days in the uh, in, in pavement recycling. So what we want to do, I just want to give you the understanding, give you a little understanding or cover the basics of cold central plant recycling. Uh, there's a couple of different processes that you can do this, so we'll talk about those. We'll talk about the recycling agents that are commonly used in CCPR and their differences in performance. There are some additives that we can add to these mixes that will improve their performance. So we'll let you know what they are and briefly what they do to the mix. And we'll give a real quick overview and give you a perspective of uh, how CCPR has performed. So FHWA and ERA will classify cold central plant recycling and cold in place recycling, both under the heading of just cold recycling, two different processes. So cold central plant is just like it says, it's done in a central location and cold in place is done in place. And in all honesty, there's really no difference in the mix. Uh, one of them, in, in cold in place, you mill the pavement up, you run it through a plant, and you put it right back down on the road in the same place. And uh, cold central plant is done at a central location. So in all honesty, that's the only difference between the two mixes. Cold central plant recycling then is a viable alternative when we have stockpiles of high quality wrap available. And there are lots of places in this country, especially in the urban areas, where we're building up stockpiles of wrap faster than we can use them. So this is a, a, a nice economical mix that can help us use those stockpiles of wrap. And then it's also used too where um, instances or places where it's not possible to in place recycle the pavement. And Virginia has actually been the leader in the country with using cold central plant mixes. Uh, and they've done this on uh, I-81 and I-64 here in Virginia, and they've probably put down more, ton more tonnage of cold central plant recycling than anybody else in the country. So what, do we, what is it and what do we do? Well, what I want to do is I want to take clean wrap and I'm going to turn it into a new pavement. So I want to, some, at some point, I'm going to mill and stockpile my wrap, and I want to keep it clean. Uh, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. So I want to make sure that I do some good uh, stockpile management techniques and keep this wrap clean and in good shape. I'm going to have to size that wrap to the required gradation, uh, especially if that wrap if stockpile has been sitting there for a while. It may actually need to be crushed. If I want, I can improve the gradation with new aggregate. Uh, we do mix this, so it's mixed with water and a recycling agent and recycling additives if needed. Then we're going to haul it to the laydown area where we're going to place it and compact it. We need to protect it from temporary traffic before we can put a wearing surface on it. Uh, we might need to allow it to cure and could possibly re-roll it if necessary. And then it does require a surface treatment to protect it. It does go down at high air voids. It's put down cold, so 8 to 12 to 14 percent air voids is not unusual. So as far as milling and stockpiling the reclaimed asphalt pavement, you can basically bust the CCPR down into three different types or categories. So the first one is on site. And this is where the wrap is milled from the roadway to be constructed. It's hauled to a close temporary site where we're going to process it, and then we're going to return it to the same road. Uh, we've seen this used in conjunction with cold in place recycling, where I've had a, a, a thick asphalt pavement that's thermal cracked. And this is an economical way to remove most of that crack so it won't, won't reflect back through the overlay. 
So I would come in and mill off the top three to four inches, haul it to a central location on the project, then come in and do cold in place recycling. Then I would haul that CCPR mix back down, place it, and then put an overlay on top of it. And then there's imported CCPR. This is not done that often, but I'm going to take wrap from one roadway, going to haul it to a close temporary site, and then I'm going to place it on a different site. So the nice thing about those first two is I'm using a single source wrap. And I've actually seen the CCPR used was on a project in Vermont. And I'm pretty sure this is what was done there, where we did FDR on a project that needed a lot of grade and alignment corrections. And then they did all of that, and then they had a large stockpile of wrap close by. They set up a processing plant uh, and brought it in. And that wrap had come from a close by project. It wasn't a site that had been, uh, been added to for quite some time. But by far the most uh, common is central facility CCPR. And that's where I've had wrap stockpiled from various projects over time. They're stockpiled on site. And I just bring in a central facility. Uh, I'm sorry, I project, let me try that again. I've got wrap stockpiled from various projects at a central facility somewhere. And then I'm going to bring in a, a plant and I'll process this and take it to various projects around. So that is, again, by far the most common. I'm going to need to probably size the wrap. Now, if it came from a, a single source, came there quickly, maybe all I have to do is run it over a scalping screed. So they'll put a scalping screed over the feed hopper uh, of, the, of the coal recycling plant, typically about an inch and a half maximum. I may want to uh, crush it and screen it to a smaller size, and if it's coming from a, an existing stockpile that's been there for a while, I may have to crush it. And so I crush it and screen it, bring in a processing plant to do that. And typically if we're going to do that, it's crushed to an inch to inch and a half maximum size, but I have seen it crushed down as small as a half inch before. All right, a typical cold central plant processing plant does not have crushing and screening uh, capabilities. So you would have to bring that in on your own. So if you see the, you can see the front end loader, he's loading the scalping hopper, which is going to bring the material into a crushing and screening unit. This happens to be the processing unit on a cold central plant train where it's going to screen the material, take the oversize and run it through a crusher, run it back through a screener, and then drop it into a pug mill. And then you see the process mix coming out and being loaded into a truck up at the top. But again, a, a typical cold central plant, you, if you want to crush and screen it, you're going to have to supply the crushing and screening unit. Uh, the nice thing about cold central plant, I can easily supplement it with other materials. And so I can supplement it with new aggregate if I want to improve the gradation, and or I can fractionate the wrap to give me a little bit better control. So what you see down at the bottom picture, there's three uh, bins in the back where they fractionated the wrap. And one of the bins has minus number four wrap. The bin in the middle has one inch to number four wrap. And the bin on the left, or on my left, uh, has three eighths inch new aggregate. Those are all being fed into a pug mill and producing the mix. Uh, as you see up in the top, you see a, a Conveyor belt going up, if you look real close, you'll see two white streaks coming out of the process material in there, and we're actually adding lime to the mix there, so we can add additives as well. But very common and makes it a very versatile mix. We're going to mix it with water and recycling agents, and we'll add some recycling additives if we want. So our recycling agents are emulsified asphalt, and expanded asphalt or foam. So with recycling agents, uh, emulsified asphalts can be either engineered emulsions. These are typically uh, uh, CSS1 emulsions that have been modified or the formulation has been f set up to match your conditions. We've used polymer modified emulsions and occasionally we'll use uh, CMS2, which is a solvent-based emulsion and add lime to it, and those are going to be used if we want to stockpile this mix for a while. We wouldn't want to use those if we're going to place them in pl uh, immediately. We don't like that solvent in there. And then we can also use expanded asphalt or foamed asphalt. So to make foamed asphalt, 
I'm going to take very hot asphalt cement, 325, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to run it through a series of nozzles where I inject a small amount of water, about 2% based on the weight of the asphalt that's going in there. And when that water, cold water, hits that hot asphalt, it's going to turn to steam. So it will make that asphalt foam and it will turn it into like a, some bubbles of asphalt that will allow me to mix the, uh, mix the material easily. Then I can add recycling additives as well. So I can put in cement. I can put that in typically as dry or I can add lime and lime is usually added as slurry. Cement is very commonly added with foamed asphalt because we need some fines to help disperse it. And so that cement will help with that. As far as what's the difference, uh, you'll hear a lot of people uh, arguing that one is better than the other one. Uh, they are different though. Foam is a binding technology. I'm going to take that asphalt, foam it, turns it into a lot of little droplets that get dispersed throughout the mix. And it's a binding technology or what they sometimes call like a tack welding technology. An emulsion is a coating technology. Emulsified asphalt is asphalt suspended in water. So it's not unusual. A typical emulsion might have two-thirds asphalt dispersed in one-third water. So it will coat the particles. And so up at the top, those two pills, uh, the one on my left is a foam one, and it does look different. You can see the little black specks all through there. And with emulsion, because it's coating, the mix tends to look entirely black. Uh, if you look at the bottom, those are two cores taken from a project where one section was foam and one section was emulsion treated. And that's the bottom part of the cores you're looking at. And as you can see, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to tell the difference between the two. One other point, uh, for binding technology to work, uh, most literature recommends uh, 5 to 20 percent fines or minus 200. And with a 100 percent wrap mix, those fines usually aren't in there. So they'll add 1 to 2 percent cement to give you those fines and help disperse those foam droplets throughout the mix. As far as the performance, uh, there was the NCHRP 9-51 study that was done by uh, Maryland and VTRC. And they studied the properties of cold in place and full deck, reclama full deck reclamation products. They looked at mixes that were made with foam and made with emulsion and found no difference in the mix properties. As far as performance, it's kind of hard to find a performance study where both were put down on the same road. But one of the best documented ones is a study out of Ontario uh, on Highway 7 where they placed an emulsion CIR and a foam CIR. And again, there's really no difference between a CIR and a CCPR mix. On the same road, they came back 10 years after they had placed it and documented the performance and basically found no difference in performance between the two sections and both were performing quite well. So we'll talk about the plants. Uh, this is a typical cold mix plant that you might see. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but right up in the front of the gray, there's the operating booth and right behind that is the, uh, the mixing chamber. There's a silo in the back. And then the other thing you can do, and we see this out west where there are multi-unit CIR trains, you can take the processing unit of the CIR train. It's a crushing and screening unit and a pug mill all in one. And so you can make a CIR mix that away. I'm sorry, a CCPR mix that away using a CIR train in the stationary mode. The other thing that we hear a lot about and it's been done, uh, I'm not sure how often, but there's a lot of talk that you can make a CCPR mix with foamed asphalt by running it through a drum mix plant. Uh, so a lot of drum mix plants have the foaming nozzles in there and you ought to be able to foam the mix. Uh, you wouldn't have to run the heat, but you have to do some modifications. And the modification you have to make is a CCPR mix is compacted more like an aggregate base than it is an asphalt mix. So it has water in there to give you compaction. So you're going to have to introduce 3 to 5 percent water based on the weight of the wrap into this mix. And so you would have to modify your drum mix plant uh, to be able to do that. So 
There's a possibility in the future you might see some people doing this. So moving on, once we've produced this mix, we're going to load it into trucks, transport it to the laydown area. Uh, prior to putting this thing down, it's just like any other asphalt mix, though I want to sweep the mix, the, the, the pavement before I put it down. It needs to be clean and it needs to be tacked so that CCPR mix will bond to it. As far as placing that recycled mix, uh, we've seen belly dump trucks used and placed it in a windrow where you come along and pick it up with a windrow elevator and put it in a conventional paver. Uh, we will, or you can use, a, a, use trucks and dump it into the hopper of a screed. Uh, we do not want to heat the screed. There are some people think this is a cold mix, it's hard to compact, and they think that if I add some heat that will improve the compaction. But if you heat the screed, all you will do is cause some of that mix to stick to the screed and you'll get drag marks and tear your mix and it's not going to help with compaction. So we do not ever want to heat that screed. One other thing we've seen done occasionally, and this is only done with low volume roads, is you can haul the mix out, uh, tailgate spread it or use a belly dump on it and then use a blade to blade that mix and then compact it. And again, only on low volume roads would you want to do this <clears throat> because you're going to have a little trouble with, with uh, smoothness. Uh, I guess you could come back once you got it bladed and compacted and profile milled it, uh, but I think it would be probably cheaper to place it another way. But we have seen this done occasionally, and again, only on low volume roads. And finally, once we brought this out and placed it, we want to compact it. The mix is quite viscous because it's cold. It's difficult to compact. So I want to use heavy compaction equipment. We recommend uh, a minimum of one pneumatic tire roller that's going to weigh at least 22 to 25 tons. I want one heavy double drum vibratory steel wheel roller, 10 to 12 tons. And then we would recommend the contractor bring a third roller out of his preference. All the rollers must have working water spray bars. We don't want the mix sticking to the roller. And then what we typically see on compaction with this is the mix fluffs quite a bit. And so we'll typically see a contractor will hit this mix with one to two passes of his vibratory roller to knock the mix down a little bit. And then he'll hit it with the uh, pneumatic tire roller and he'll roll it until the mix walks itself out and then they'll finish it up with a vibratory roller. Now they will sometimes put that pneumatic tire roller up front but the problem with that is it will sometimes bog down so deep it's very hard to get it to roll out. So hitting it with one or two passes with the steel wheel roller uh, speeds the operation up and generally works better and I think you'll find most people will be compacting it similar to that. We also need to protect that mix from temporary traffic. So after rolling is completed, we're going to, at the end of the day, we're probably going to open it back up to traffic. And if we're concerned about raveling, uh, we might want to apply a fog seal to minimize that raveling. And if we're going to put a fog seal on it, probably want to apply blotter sand to pick up any excess fog seal. And then once that's cured out, we'll open it up to traffic. Uh, this is done more with emulsified asphalt mixes than it is with foam mixes. Foam mixes cure fairly quickly and it's not unusual uh, to not do this on a foam mix. Now one of the other nice things about putting the fog seal and the sand seal is these mixes go down at high air voids and are a bit permeable and they need to be protected from moisture. So if it's going to be several days before I'm going to put the overlay on it, if I fogged and sand sealed it, if I get a rain on it, it's going to do a a whole lot better job of shedding that water and it won't get into the mix than if it didn't have the fog seal. So that's kind of an extra bonus of doing the fog seal. So I'm going to allow this mix to cure before I put the overlay and I might re-roll it if necessary. So what most specs will say is we want to let traffic on it for two to three days give that time for that mix to cure out and the water to get out of there. I don't want to trap a lot of excess water in the mix. Uh, so we usually say a minimum of two to three days, especially for emulsified asphalt mixes. And sometimes we look for it to cure out to a residual moisture content, maybe less than two to three percent moisture. 
the only problem we have with that in some instances, in some areas, your in situ pavement, the moisture content may be higher than that, and you're gonna have a hard time ever getting down that low. Uh, foamed asphalt cures quickly, and there's kind of been a, move to, a trend moving to overlaying that foamed asphalt as soon as the next day. Now with emulsified asphalt, uh, they typically go down pretty close to optimum asphalt or a little bit higher. So re-rolling them after they've cured and broke a little bit, some of that water's drained off, sometimes you can pick up an extra two to three pounds of density. So that can be done at the end of the day or within the next couple of days. But the pavement's going to have to be warm, so we don't recommend you try it unless it's up to at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. You would want to run three or four passes over it to see if you're picking up any density. If you're not picking up any density, you don't want to do it. If you are picking up density, you can continue to re-roll the pavement, but you want to monitor it closely. Because if I start getting any roller checking or roller cracking, or I'm not picking up any density, I want to discontinue it because I could do more damage than good. Again, something we see with emulsion, uh, especially out in the desert southwest, uh, not so much with foamed asphalt. Then we want to put the final surfacing on there. Uh, hot mix asphalt or warm mix asphalt overlay works really well. And we'll see this, see this on higher volume highways. Uh, for low volume roads, we've seen plenty of chip seals, double chip seals, cape seals, et cetera, put down and we've seen sur uh, slurry or microsurfacing as well. But due to the higher in-place air voids, these things have to be covered up if you, to protect them from moisture damage. And as far as performance studies, again, Virginia's kind of led the country in doing performance studies on cold central plants. So we have some sections down on I-81 and I-64, and then VDOT put some sections down on the NCAT test road there's a small section on Lee Road 159. Then they did some more on US 280 and Min Road. So we'll real quick talk about these. Uh, the VDOT sections with cold central plant at the NCAT test tracks are basically the same thing that was put down on I-81. So they had three sections. One had eight inches of an FDR mix, five inches of CCPR, and four inches of asphalt. This was in the, in, the inside lane. And then the outside lanes had uh, six inches, they put five inches of CCPR and over four and six inches of hot mix asphalt. At the NCAT test track, they've gone through three full seasons. So uh, actually pretty close to 30 million easels with basically no distress. The section with FDR, they think is a perpetual pavement. I think they're still uh, running some more test sections on it. Uh, the section with only the four inch of asphalt overlay was starting to show some deterioration. So it, it was getting close to starting to reaching its end of its design life. But 30 million easels is a lot of easels to put on a road. So they perform well. And then at NCAT, they had the uh, Lero 159 preservation studies. So they had one section that was left, and Buzz Powell decided to put down a CCPR section. And then he put a 3 quarter inch thin lay on top of it to see how it would hold out. So this was placed in 2012. It's had over, I think it's probably close to 1.5 million easels now. Uh, the performance has been excellent. There's less than 4% low severity cracking, less than three millimeters of rutting. And the IRI is actually 120, which is not so good, but you gotta remember these are a lot of short test sections. So it started out about that high. It really hasn't increased with time. So with a three quarter inch overlay, it's performed quite well. So then we had the test track that had four and six inches of hot mix over it, the Lee Road that had three quarter inch thin lay. The question was, how thin can we go with an overlay? So they went out to US 280, right outside of Auburn, which had a four lane divided highway, 18,080 T with 16% trucks. And they put down a four inch CCPR or CIR over four inches of old asphalt with a one inch thin lay. These have been down for a little over five years with over three million easels. And the whole idea was they expected them to eventually fail. They just wanted to know how much they could take before they would fail. So as far as cracking, all the test sections are performing well. IRI is still good. We've had two sections, one CCPR and the other CIR, that have dropped in the rutting from the good to just barely into the fair. But they still say they're all performing well. 
uh, and they're monitoring closely because, again, they expect these to eventually fail because of the thin asphalt overlay. And then up at in Min Road, uh, Auburn's warm weather, so they decided to put down some cold sections up in Min Road. So on uh, 70th Street, it's the existing uh, four inch road with six inch granular base with a clay subgrade. It's actually in very poor shape. It's probably a better candidate for FDR than CIR. But they put down, uh, milled out and put down two three inch CCPR sections with a one inch asphalt thin lay and they left one inch of the existing pavement underneath it. One of the sections had foamed asphalt with 1% cement. The other one had emulsified asphalt. They were put down in uh, 2019, and to this date they're performing well, uh, but there's not a lot of data, published data out there yet. As far as traffic, it's kind of low to intermediate traffic. The estimated 20-year easels is about 1.25 million easels. So we'll be watching those closely as well. So in summary, where am I going to use CCPR? Well, you can use it any place you would put down an asphalt base mix or a binder mix. It's an economical alternative to new construction. Uh, you're using materials that you've already bought and paid for. It's sustain sustainable. We're going to reuse existing materials and we're going to place it without heat. Uh, although there are trucking, you do have to truck the mix. And CCPR has a good history of performance. So again, uh, that's all I have. Uh, it's something that I'm sure you'll see and point out again, I'm sure you will in Virginia because they're kind of leading the nation on tons of CCPR mix that have been placed. So thank you very much.